Welcome back to another episode of Novellio. Today is Sunday, May 30th, 2021. I'm going to continue on with my second last reading of Hot Winter Sun by Jessica Russell. And just to let everyone know that tomorrow will be our last reading of Hot Winter Sun. And tomorrow's episode will be live at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Catherine came back to an empty house as the family and servants were all at the spring bonfire. Most people in the neighborhood went each year and more often than not, gypsy caravans stopped as well to sell their wares, tell fortunes for some coin, and perform dances for those from surrounding homes. People were determined to give their children one last bit of enjoyment before the end, and Catherine was glad of this. She wanted the house to herself and was pacing in the gallery, fighting off tears as she remembered Julian's words in the meadow. For the first time since her return from France, she felt lost and hopeless. She had been she had seen him angry before, but that was back when she didn't care. It was a shattering feeling now. She knew she couldn't go on without him. She would do what he wanted. She would marry him. I will find him and I tell him I was wrong. I will beg him to forgive me and he will because he loves me. He is right. I cannot go on without him. I can't lose them both. Catherine, Rose came up running up the stairs, breaking into her reverie. It's been your, it's been heard your father is coming here. You must tell Julian at once. My father again? Now? After all this time? She asked incredulously. Yes, it's something to do with little Robert. I've been looking for you. I think Julian went to see Paul Ashington. He must come back. Do you want me to fetch him? Catherine didn't stop to answer, but ran past the startled maid all the way to the stables. She managed to saddle a horse and set for Ashington Heights. It looked as if there was a storm brewing, but she cared little for that. Upon arriving, she was dismayed when Lizette's lady maid answered the door and went for her mistress. Why, Catherine, it's a terrible night to be out. Do you... Catherine cut her off and told her to get Julian at once. Lizette raised her eyebrows at the command. Tell him my father has threatened to come to Briarwood and I need his help. Lizette departed for a few moments. Julian says he's otherwise occupied and he'll talk to you later, she said when she returned. Did you tell him about my father? she cried. Yes, he doesn't want to see you. Catherine, I don't want to be in the middle of this. Why not just wait till he gets home? She stared at Lizette for a moment, feeling as if her life was collapsing around her. He couldn't have, she stammered. Well, he did. I'm sorry. There's nothing I can do. Finally, Catherine turned and walked out of the courtyard in a daze. Numb with fear and anxiety, she went to where she had tied her horse, but the mare was gone. It was dark now, and heavy rain was falling amid the flash and fury of a violent thunderstorm. She stared at the place where her mare had been tied, and confusion seemed to descend on her. What is happening? Am I really standing here in a storm, having been rejected by Julian? Did I walk here or ride? Where is my horse? Am I going mad? She turned back to Briarwood at practically a run. She had to try to protect her son, but how? She lost consciousness of the rain beating down on her and could only think of Robert. But where will I go? What will I do? The near full moon came from behind a cloud suddenly and cast an eerie glow on the fields. All at once everything looked wrong, yet she knew she was on the correct path. The will-o'-wisps seemed as if they were dancing, and she fancied they were calling out to her. Her thoughts were jumbled, and part of her wanted to collapse into nothingness, but her child drove her on. Then a voice seemed to come from a long way off, and she thought she heard hoofs. Lady Catherine, here, let me take you the rest of the way. Suddenly a lance appeared in front of her on horseback. He jumped down and came to her. Your horse came back, my lady, and I knew I must come find you. She must have gotten loose. Here, let me help you up. You should have stayed where you were until it was suitable to walk. Lance was relieved to see Corrine so when he arrived with Catherine. She was just returning from the bonfire as were the others due to the rain. Catherine, what on earth? Corrine said. Is my father here? Corrine cried, ignoring them both and running into the house to the nursery where Rose was watching over the child as she promised. Corrine followed her, begging her to slow down. Your father? What are you talking about? No one is here. She spilled out the story in a somewhat coherent incoherent way. Catherine, you're frightening me, Carinza said. 
When Catherine assured herself that Robert was safe, they went back out into the hall. She leaned on the banister, out of breath and extremely fatigued. Yet in the midst of it all, she suddenly remembered that it was here that Julian had said that she would never be happy without him. And she dropped her face into her hands in that age-old gesture of despair. Oh, Carrie, what will I ever do? My father must still be on his way, and Lizette told me Julian refused to come help me. I've lost his love forever, and I have no hope without Julian's protection. Catherine, what madness is this? No one has come here. I don't understand who told you this. And Julian loves you. You've become his whole life. No, you don't understand. He's not one to be rejected, and I've done it too many times now. Oh, Carrie, I don't know what I shall do. When Julian is this angry, there is no getting forgiveness. I have seen him like this before. He's truly finished with me this time, I tell you. I know it. You are letting hysteria take over. You have to speak to him yourself before you make these assumptions. You know you cannot trust Lizette after the incident with your brother. No, he hates me now. I've thwarted him too many times. He's rejected me for good. I'm going to, to, to my room. I feel ill. Carissa went immediately to the stables and saw that Rook had returned. She sent Lance for the doctor and asked Rook to fetch Julian from the Ashington Heights. I'm not sure what's going on. Just tell him he must come home at once. She then made a drink for Catherine and instructed Rose to take it to her without delay. Much later, she heard Julian entering the hall. Why is the doctor here? he demanded. Oh, I sent Rook to fetch you at Paul's. I was wondering what took him taking him so long. I fear you've sent him on a wild goose chase. I was not at the heights today. Tell me why Oscar is here. Well, I was afraid Catherine may be ill. She's somewhat hysterical over some rumor about her father and was out in the rain. Did you... For God's sake, woman, make sense, he interrupted. What do you mean she may be ill? From what? And why is she out in the rain? This storm has brewed up before she left Paul's, and I suppose she was determined to get home regardless. Lance came upon her when she was almost to the manor and brought her the rest of the way, but she was drenched and overexerted. I sent for the doctor because I thought she might be chilled, but don't want, don't get beside yourself. She may just be overwrought because she thought you turned her away. I didn't mean to make it sound as if she was seriously ill. I only sent for the doctor as a precaution. I don't understand, Julian cried. Turn her away from where? I have not seen her since this afternoon. That discourse was not exactly pleasant, but I have never turned her away from anywhere. I feel like I'm going mad. Say something that makes sense. Julian, please stop shouting at me. I'm still piecing it together myself. She was told that her father was coming here to try to get the child, or something. I'm not really even sure. It was something somewhat confusing, but naturally this rumor made her hysterical. He did come here several times before, after all. So she went to Lord Ashington's home to find you. That's where Rose thought you were. Lizette received her and told her you refused to speak to her even though you knew about her father. That was all I could get out of her because, as I've said, she is practically in a state of collapse. By then, from fighting her way through the storm, I sent Lance for the doctor and Rook to get you, and that is all I can tell you. Yes, I had mentioned to some of the servants that I planned to go see Paul, but I never made it, and the day grew long, so I simply came home. Lizette lied to her. I must tell Catherine at once. But why didn't she ride to the Ashingtons? Why didn't she ride to the Ashingtons with a storm brewing? Why on earth did she walk? She didn't, Carissa replied. Her horse came back on its own, and that's when Lance went to find her. But by the time he came upon her, she was her. She was almost here. Lizette, she is a monster, Julian exclaimed. I'm starting to think all these strange happenings trace back to her. She clearly lied to Catherine, and it wouldn't surprise me if she was the one who loosened her horse. Perhaps behind her frivolous demeanor is a darker side. Am I being paranoid? No, I was beginning to think the same thing. God save me, I had no idea Catherine was even looking for me. How, how I angered that Almighty that we should constantly be at cross purposes this way. Refuse to help her. It's insanity. How dare Lizette tell her that? My God, Carissa, if I lose Catherine after all this, I shall truly do that woman harm. Please calm yourself, Julian. She is not sick unto death. I believe it is merely the chills, but of course when you consider her heart, I was certainly not going to take chances, so I made her a good posset and sent for the doctor. I didn't mean to give the impression she's at death's door. I think it would be best if you calm yourself before you go up there. At this, Julian finally drew a long breath and attempted to regain his composure. 
He allowed Carinza to pour a brandy and hand it to him before he headed to the main staircase. Then he paused and called back to Carinza. Blake didn't actually show up then? Carinza shrugged in frustration. It was either a rumor after all, or he lost his nerve at the 11th hour. We'll go and get a gun from the cabinet. You know how to use one, and if by chance he should appear and no one is about, don't hesitate to threaten him with it and call for me at once. Julian went into the room quickly without knocking or hesitating, practically pushing the door out of his way. However, when he saw Catherine, all his anger and irritation evaporated and he stood frozen by her bedside. She was far worse than Carinza thought. The doctor was about to say she should be left alone, but Julian would not wait. He sat down on the edge of the bed and took her hand. Open your eyes, Kathy. Look at me and tell me you are alive and well and that you love me. At this, her eyes opened and a smile instantly illuminated her face. Julian, the voice I've been waiting to hear. She grasped his hand with strength that surprised him. I love you so much. Tell me you're not angry anymore. The sweetest relief he ever felt flooded over him and quickly on its heels bewilderment. Oh, Kathy, how can you even want me near you when I'm... You think I deserted you. Did you really believe I refused your help? I can care for not what happened, Julian. Only say you love me. Forever, my darling, but I must explain. No, I want you here next to me and that is all. These past hours were some of the darkest in my life. Hold me now, Julian, lest I die and it not be in your arms. He pulled her up against him fiercely, willing her to cheat death once more. Oh, Kathy, when I think of this harm that has come to you because of that wretched creature, I have murderous thoughts. Well, has that lied to you? I was not, I was never even there today. How I loathe that woman. I should have fed her to the wolves when I had the chance. You talk madness, my love, but your talk pleases me. You do love me, or you should not be so angry. But let me speak at this, for I may not have the chance soon after I could never die in peace with your questions unanswered. What question, sweetheart? Do you remember a night in the gallery the second time you asked me to marry you? Sarah came and we never finished the conversation. Do you remember your questions? I remember each one. You asked me to marry you, to pledge my soul to you, to have your children. You asked me if I never wanted us to part. You asked me to grow old with you. I never answered. I would have answered yes, but we were interrupted and after that my courage failed me. You told me I would never be happy without you and you were right. But to my own detriment, I turned back to my fears. Tell me I am not too late to answer yes, and then whether I live or die, I shall be happy. How she remembered. How she could recall every detail, every sentence and place and circumstance. You shan't die, Kathy, and nothing will ever part us. As you have seen, even fate will not allow it. As if she had been clinging to her last ounce of strength for this answer, she fell into an almost instant deep sleep. Then suddenly Dr. Lincroft who Julian forgot was in the room, came forward. Begging your pardon, sir, but whatever is between you two must at least wait a few days. This evening's events were a considerable strain and she needs to rest. Yes, of course, he replied, but then went on as if he had forgotten what the man had said. But she has given me the desire of my heart. I do understand, sir, said Dr. Lincroft, who was growing more than a little exasperated, but what you must understand is that she's never been truly well since her return and we don't want this chill turning into a fever yes yes julian said impatiently wondering if this catastrophic thing had not happened if she would had ever accepted him completely it sobered him for a moment but at the same time his heart rejoiced soon after that he went to question the servants to find out why catherine was told that her father was coming to the manor when it had clearly not been the case it was eventually determined that Rose told Catherine of the rumor, but she begged Julian to believe that it was only because she wanted to protect Catherine, not because she was the source of the recent trouble in the home. Rose was the only person in the house as everyone else was at the bonfire. She had been watching little Robert and Sarah's children and said she did not purposely tell only Catherine. It was merely that no one else was there to tell. Julian had no doubt that she was being honest, but he was frustrated when Rose refused to say who had told her that Catherine's father was supposedly coming. She pretended not to remember, but Julian knew that that was not the case. The mystery, however, was quickly solved a few days later when Paul called on the household and asked Julian to see, see Julian in private. I appreciate the fact that you will even speak to me after what my sister did the other day. I thank you for not blaming me. 
He had heard about Lizette's latest fiasco from servants' gossip. There's no blame I could give you, Julian replied. People are responsible for their own actions and the fault cannot be laid at the feet of another merely because they are related. However, I have a feeling that it's all, all you came to say. No, the tale unfortunately gets worse. Lizette was the one who started the rumor about Catherine's father coming here. Rose heard it from Millicent, Lizette's lady maid, who quickly crept away to tell Rose. Rose only pretended not to remember because she was afraid it would get Millicent in trouble, which, of course, you could understand. And Julian nodded. I don't think I need to tell you who gave the supposed information to Millicent. Julian shook his head in amazement. Even using unsuspecting maids as pawns in her little game, he said. Yes, Paul went on. But what bothers me, though, is that she insists she only saw, thought Catherine would leave again if she heard such a rumor. This is the absurd and shallow way she thinks. She remembers different occasions where Catherine talked about going to France for fear her father would come and try to retrieve the children or Robert. She claims this is all she had in mind with this fiasco. She was likely surprised when Catherine showed up at our door but quickly used the opportunity to be spiteful over the episode with Christopher when you threw her out. Here's what disturbs me, though. She didn't untether Catherine's horse. She didn't? Julian said plainly. No, she swore to God that she had nothing to do with that part, and I find it odd that she would admit to everything else, but not that. Also, I remember that her dress and her hair were perfect, as always, throughout the evening. There was no way she could have done it. In fact, Catherine's illness has sobered her a bit, and she keeps insisting that she did not untie the horse, and is sorry for the things went this far. She did not tell a servant to do it either, because I questioned everyone myself, and I know they were not lying. That fact disturbs me, particularly in light of everything that has taken place recently. I have to admit that night I was ready to believe Lizette was behind it all, but now I'm not so inclined to think it, Ju Julian said. The woman is not a murderess, and if she were the, the culprit, that would mean she was also responsible for Robert's death. I can't see my way clear to that conclusion. For what purpose would she want to kill Robert, whom she at one time believed might marry her? Out of jealousy, perhaps, that he married Catherine, but it just seems too fantastic. I don't believe it either. Understand I make no excuses for other, her other behavior. Her obsession with you and her extreme jealousy of Catherine has turned her into a dreadful person, but it doesn't sit right with me that she would physically harm someone. I believe whoever untied Catherine's horse merely took advantage of the circumstances. Then it would have to be someone in my own home, Paul. Or someone who was watching her constantly. Who? The possibilities are becoming fewer and fewer all the time, leading me to conclusions I don't want to form. Eventually, there was nothing left to be said, and Paul departed, offering to do whatever he could to help. But Julian could not rest or leave Catherine's side for very long, as he knew now that the guilty party had to be someone in his own household. There was no, there was more constraint than ever throughout the manor in the following days and it seemed to Julian that the entire household were eyeing each other with suspicion. Servants looked warily at other servants, and Julian saw Sarah look at Carinza with an expression that emanated right, outright hatred. This is horrible. The entire household must live with the fact that there is a murderer about, yet we have a, not a solitary clue as to the person's identity. It is only a matter of time until we are all turning on each other like spiders in a jar. The doctor had insisted Catherine would remain in bed for a few days, and that length of time was almost up when James Burroughs came to find Julian with a somewhat urgent message. Pardon the interruption, sir, but I've come with to inform you that Edward's father, Reginald, is dying, and he is insisting that he must talk to Lady Bradshaw and yourself. None can quiet him, and we were wondering if you could pay him a visit, although we know that you may have many issues that need your attention right now. Of course, I'll come, he said at once. I'll go tell Catherine, and then I'll go straight to his cottage. When he went to speak to Catherine, however, she insisted on coming with him. I have an idea what this is all about, and I can't stay in bed for the rest of my life anyway, Julian. I'm certainly quite well now. It was just a chill. Julian reluctantly agreed, and the two made their way to Reginald's cottage. As Catherine suspected, his dying wish was for them to believe he had no hand in the murder of Robert. There was no longer any doubt in either of their minds that he was innocent, as this deathbed declaration had a clear ring of truth. 
What do you make of it, Julian? They walked arm in arm away from the cottage, taking the lilac point back to the manor to avoid inclines. I'm not sure I know what I think, Julian replied. He sounded very sincere, and yet all the evidence points to him. No other lead has ever emerged, according to Constable Linton, except your father, who was far away in Plymouth. He seemed so determined for us to believe him. I must tell you something, Julian. Reginald spoke to me once before and told me emph emphatically that he was not the one who shot Robert. In fact, he made a point to come find me to tell me that. What did you say? What could I say? I told him that it, it may always remain unsolved, but he was not satisfied with that. He truly wanted me to say that I believed him, so I did. Now I know he is being honest, and not only that, but that he knows who the culprit is. I am inclined to believe that, too, because at one point he said, it was not me, it was, and then he trailed off. He knows the murderer, but for some reason does not want to come out with it. Perhaps it was someone close to him, but the only living relative of, of his that I know of is Edward, and I cannot picture him doing such a thing. He was pleased to get out from it under his father's roof. You of all people know what it feels like to live in a household like that. Did it seem to you that as if he was genuinely wanted to be away from Reginald's gloomy home? Or is it possible he came into the household to spy for the roundheads? I remember when the law was posing that question to me. The possibility that has often crossed my mind. But if I am a good judge of character, as you think, I would stake my life on Edward's sincerity. The way he talked to me one time about those days in his father's home, it just seemed too real. I think a true Puritan speaking ill of Puritans would likely sound as if he were acting, at least to some degree. The look I saw in his eye? No, I still cannot believe it of Edward. Also, he truly loves Sarah, and if there was ever a woman who was not cut out to be a Puritan, it is Sarah. I doubt even for a spying mission that a Puritan would marry one such as her. Catherine smiled. Remember how intent she was on marrying Stephen Godfrey? I do indeed. How happy I am that that unfortunate incident with the child worked out so well. And we must remember that was because of Edward too. Nay, I cannot believe that he is a murderer either. But his father's words today have left me bewildered. I only hope to God that someday we will know the truth and be able to put it behind us once and for all. Julian drew closer and they walked with their arms around each other toward the manor. Both always felt as if Robert were still there, and to Catherine the two merged in her mind more often than not, and she wondered how one woman could have been fortunate enough to have the love of both of them. Julian was deeply pleased that Robert had her love had her, had, had her love while he lived and mourned again that his life was cut short. As the sun set, they both turned Reginald's words over and again in their minds, trying to decipher what he knew and what he was holding back. Catherine was relieved one day when Karinza called her into the sewing room to show her some fabric she thought would make a lovely wedding gown. Deep down, Catherine always worried that perhaps Karinza was still holding out hope that Julian would one day propose to her. Karinza smiled and said, I suppose we overdid it a bit when purchasing materials for the children's clothes. I think they are better dressed than anyone in the household. And Catherine laughed. As you can see, Karinza went on, there are some beautiful colors and textures here. There is this deep wine or the dark blue, both of which are perfect for with your coloring. Of course, this shade of green is all the rage right now, too. But you mustn't think you should choose something from here to make me happy. I just thought you would want to take a look. Although Catherine had been determined to find something to her liking, it turned out that this was no ruse. She immediately fell in love with the deep blue silk and set off with Karinza to buy some lace to match it. Catherine and Julian decided they wanted to waste no time getting married, as the entire household was poised and ready for that knock on the door that would tell them the king had surrendered, and their wish was to be gone before that fateful day. Catherine wanted no sadness on her wedding day and refused to speculate about the war or the person who meant her harm. Deciding that for at least one day she would drive these things from her mind. In her wedding dress she stood in front of the mirror in the room where she once shared with Robert. 
a room she had not entered since her return. She needed one last moment with her late husband, but wanted to leave those parts apartments before Julian found her there. She was afraid he would think she was having second thoughts. She realized that he believed he would never be able to live up to Robert, and perhaps didn't understand that she loved him for exactly who he was, just as she had loved Robert for himself. At the doorway, she paused and stared back at the old looking glass, remembering that long ago day when she thought Carinza had glared at her in a menacing way, and couldn't help but smile when she viewed herself in the beautiful gown that Carinza had helped her make. She was correct, as she always was with fashions, and the deep blue was ideal with Catherine's weed-colored hair and fair skin. As if any of it matters now, and we shall soon all be exiles. She laughed at herself and Julian, who had insisted on a proper wedding that she would always remember. It reminded her of Robert's insistence on a memorable honeymoon, war or no war. Yet another similarity that had emerged to confirm what their father had told her long ago. She thought how life often turned out differently from what one imagined. What was that line from Shakespeare's? We strut and fret our ire hour on the stage. Something like that, she shrugged and laughed at herself and the rest of the family, with their personalities and the little idiosyncrasies, and loved them all no less for it. Julian considered himself the happiest man on earth. He inspected his attire with a critical eye as if he could ever look at anything less than elegant. However, she was not quite as lighthearted as Catherine, as he could not drive from his mind that her would-be murderer would be enjoying today's festivities with everyone else. He did his best to push such thoughts from his mind, not wanting anything too dark to show in his face on this all-important day. Not caring for superstition or protocol, he entered Catherine's room and closed the door behind him. You are too beautiful to be real, he exclaimed. At least once a day, I find a time... I think to myself, she has never looked lovelier, but now you do. And you, she replied, should not even be here. They all say it's bad luck, and as if my intelligent, practical Catherine believes in bad luck. And even if you do, I don't care. You are exquisite, and I had to see you. Your father was right about you. You have to do everything your own way. My father told you that? Yes, his words were, Julian must do things his own way, were not at all, and how right he was. Yes, and that is why you and he got along so well together. You always got the straight story from him. No hedging, nothing said, just for propriety. He told you as it told you as it was, and that's what you wanted. No worrying or wondering, no subterfuge, just a simple truth. Catherine smiled incredulously, and Julian went on. Yes, see. There is that moment when I was Robert, understanding you completely. I'll get there with my mystifying cat. It just may take me longer. Suddenly, she looked serious, and Julian asked, Am I not right about that? Very right, she replied. It's just that it made me think of something else. She held out her left hand, on which was the ring symbolized her marriage to Robert. I don't know what to do with it, she said helplessly. I can't offer my hand for a ring when there is one already there. Yet I can't bear to take it off and lay it aside as if Robert never existed. In that moment, Julian knew exactly what to do. He carefully took the ring from her left hand and placed it on the same finger of the right hand. This way you can wear them both forever, he said. For a moment she felt as if time stood still and could do nothing but stare into his eyes. Julian, she said at last, Remember when I told you, for all the fierceness, you are sometimes the sweetest man God ever made? Yes, it's still true. Oh, here you are, said Catherine, who suddenly appeared in the room. Or, oh, here you are, said Clarissa, who suddenly appeared in the room, and then, Julian, this is bad luck. You must leave here at once. Ah, oh, and who would dare to contradict Clarissa? Julian said, smiling. I bet best make my way to the chapel. Clarissa, who was standing up with Catherine, had, was dressed in a pale blue gown that created a striking contrast to her dark auburn hair 
and her sister thought she looked positively breathtaking. I can't believe you are finally marrying Catherine, Clarissa exclaimed to Julian and then added, I'm going to marry Paul, before she flounced from the room to see if Carissa was ready yet. Should you warn Paul that Clarissa's first crush has been bestowed upon him? Catherine said, unable to hold back her laughter. I wouldn't dream of it, replied Julian, and left the room smiling.